Well, welcome to the services of the Ministry of Christ Church. The following sermon was presented by its pastor, Reverend William P. Gale, in Glendale, California, on April the 21st, 1974. The title of this sermon is The Serpent Seed. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Shall we pray? <clears throat> in the name of Jesus Christ, who is Yahweh, our Yahshua, who is the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, all one. Our Heavenly Father, Jesus... We give thee thanks for this gathering of thy children. We give thee thanks for this great nation of thy kingdom, the United States of America, this new Jerusalem where you have ordained your people, the true Israelites of the book, to be in these latter days of Jacob's trouble. So as we see all of this trouble around about us in this land, we give thee thanks that we are here to participate as thy battle axe and thy weapons of war, knowing that we are thy children, we are the Israelites of the book, and now called Christians. We of the descendants of Adam and the seed of Adam know who we are and know our God. So as we know who you are, Jesus, we pray to you, as you taught us to pray when you came into the earth and you took on a flesh body as our kinsman redeemer, and you said, pray thusly, Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. And we pray in thy name, Yahweh, our Yahshua, which in English is Jesus the Christ, who is the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, all one. Amen. <clears throat> well, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. This is the <clears throat> 21st day of April, 1974. For the benefit of those who are listening to these sermons on tapes. <clears throat> and today we have a subject called the serpent seed. Now, we have given a sermon in the past which was very appreciated across the country. People played it to others and it shocked the new people who heard it. But it was the seed of Cain or the seed line of Cain. Now, when we use the word seed and the Bible uses the word seed, it means descendant. You all know you're descendants of someone, aren't you? You are the descendants of the people who built this great land, aren't you? You're the descendants of those who have been somewhere else at some other time, aren't you? You'd better be. Where did you come from? That's the reason we use the word identity. Identity is the key to the Bible. Now, when we get into the identity picture, we have to identify what? Mainly, the Bible tells of nations the nations of Abraham's seed. All right, the nations of Abraham's descendants. Well, before Abraham, there were others, weren't there? There were Noah. From Noah, the tenth patriarch of Adam, there are hundreds and hundreds of years, several thousand years. And so as you go back into this descendancy, you go back to Adam and Eve, don't you? Well, when you get back to Adam and Eve in the Bible, you think you're starting with the first people on the, in the earth, and you're not. That's what all the churches and the clergy have told you for years and years and years, that when you start with Adam and Eve, you're starting with the first people on the earth. Isn't that true? They told me that, so I'm sure they've told you that. That is not true. It is false. Your Bible tells you there were people on the earth before Adam and Eve. It tells you that in the first chapter of the book of Genesis, in a synopsis, that God created races of people. The Hebrew word was enosh. But the translators confused you because they put the word man... In English, where the word was enosh in Hebrew. And the word man in English translates from the Hebrew word Adam or Adam in English. So when they said, let us make man in our image, as the translators put it in the first chapter of Genesis, that was erroneous. That was an erroneous translation. The word was, let us create the enosh in our image. The word man did not appear until the second chapter of Genesis, where the Bible brought in Adam and Eve. That was man and woman. But the others were male and female. So when we understand this Bible, we understand that God did create races of people. The English word by the translators is used as the word generations. If you look up the word generations, you'll find the Greek word was genia. And properly translated, that word means race. Oh, I've said a dirty word now, haven't I? Race. We're going to continue to tell you that the race is the key to the Bible. This Bible is about a race of people, and other races, too, it tells about. God created those other races. Then the Bible brings in Adam and Eve 
after all the other races were created. And it says, after God rested the seventh day or the seventh age from all the creations, from everything he made, including races of people, it says there was not a man to till the ground. There was not an Adam to till the ground. Adam wasn't here on the earth. Then the Bible brings in Adam and Eve after all the other races were created. And she shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. You'll find the notes, note one or two, the little numbers by the word woman and by the word man at that second chapter of Genesis, verse 23. And you go into the notes, and the Hebrew word for Adam is ish. The Hebrew word for Eve is isha, the feminine and the masculine, ish, I-S-H. It means in Hebrew offspring or progeny. Now, what do you call your progeny or your male offspring when you have one now in these days and you're using the English language? You don't call him your ish, do you? You call him your son, don't you? And you call her your daughter. That's what it meant, son and daughter. Son of who? It didn't tell you then, did it? But the Bible always gives two witnesses. So you go into Luke, chapter 3, verse 38, and see what the son, who's the son of Sue, using the English language now, translated to the word son from the word ish. <coughs> it says, son of Seth, who is the son of Adam, who is the son of God. Your Bible says Adam is the son of God. Eve is the daughter of God. This means literal children, physical offspring of God. Just like your son is your offspring. Well, what does this all mean? <clears throat> Why haven't the clergy looked at it in teaching the scriptures? It's important because Adam is the son of God, but all the churches tell you Jesus Christ is the son of God, don't they? No, the Bible says Adam is the son of God. And Eve is a daughter. That's the word ish. Ra in Hebrew, R-A, means to rule. Rule what? Well, the word kingdom means administration, rule, and government. So now we have a connection. Ish, Ra, or government. L, E-L, Ish, Ra, L. Three Hebrew words. E-L. All right, you go into your scriptures in your Bible and note the names of all the ancient prophets of the Bible. And you'll find their names in, in those two letters, E-L. How about the archangel, Michael? How about the prophet, Daniel? Ezekiel? Samuel? Men of God, of course. So issue ruling with God. Ruling what? A kingdom or a government. And that's what the Bible's all about. So we're going to show you in the Bible today where there is another descendant on this earth. The descendants of the devil. Oh, some say, well, there is no devil. Well, then why look at the book then? The Bible's all wrong if there is no devil. Jesus spoke to him. Get behind me, Satan, he said, didn't he? Don't you know you shouldn't tempt Yahweh, your Yahshua? What says the Lord thy God in English? All right, there's lots of instances of Satan. The third chapter of Genesis, right in the first of the Bible. What does it do? When God told Adam and Eve, do not partake of the fruit of the tree of knowledge of good and evil. And some of these preachers in your church has been telling you that Eve ate an apple off a tree. Show me that in the Bible. No wonder people don't want to read the Bible. I'm going to get a lot of that garbage from these silly preachers who don't even know their scriptures. Eve didn't eat an apple off a tree. The tree that God was talking about in symbolic language is a tree with knowledge. Not the tree of knowledge. And the tree of knowledge or the tree that has knowledge is your family or racial tree. That's the tree God's talking about, the family of Adam and Eve. That's your racial or family tree. And that means simply don't mix this tree or this race with the other races that God created who are on the earth a million seven hundred and fifty thousand years before your race ever appeared on the earth. Because your race is the race of God. Now, this is an important thing and we're going to concentrate on it and emphasize it because everyone's afraid of the word race. Yes, these blacks can go out and talk about their race. They can form the National Association for the Agitation of Colored People, and they don't organize it. They don't finance it. The Jews do. The head of the NAA... ...has been a Jew. Why? I told you about this phony black they put up in the front. They always have one in the front to make fool everybody.
everybody that it's not Jewish. Wilkins, Roy Wilkins, was their front for years and still is. They sent him down to Arizona because they were trying to agitate the Indians down there. And Barry Goldwasser was one of the life members of the NAACP, poses as a conservative. Well, he was down there and they had this big banquet and they had the chief of the Indian tribes there and this black, who was an NAACP leader, gets up and says, agitates them, telling them how the white man treated the Indians so bad. Look what they've done to you. So you'd better join with us and we'll help you Indians and protect you from these vicious white people. And the Indian chief got up and he said, Mr. Wilkins, we don't need you. We don't need your NAACP. We don't want anything to do with you. He said, I've got news for you. When they start playing cowboys and niggers, there won't be many of you left either. And that's the true story. That happened. So you see, it's all right for them to talk about race. It's all right for them to get on a television and say, Whitey, we're going to kill you. It's all right for them to tell you that your law enforcement officers are pigs and they're going to kill them in order so that they can't protect you. But if you mention the word race, you're a racist. For the white race. Well, now, I said another word wrong, didn't I? White. We're not white. There is no such thing as a white race. The Bible describes Adam as ruddy and reddish complexion, capable of showing red upon anger. And if you look at my skin, it's red, and yours too. It's not white. No such thing as a white race. Why are we reddish and ruddy? Can we show red upon anger? I've seen angry Asiatics. And they don't get red when they get angry. You watch. You go get a Jap or a Chinaman or anybody mad and get him right in front of you and you know what he turns? No, don't stop there. Might as well include the other. Get a nigga mad and he turns blue. It's a fact. Look at their color. They get bluish. A bluish tint comes on their face. But you get a, a Caucasian now. Now we're using the right word, see? Caucasian. You get him angry and his face gets red, right? And that's exactly what the Bible says about Adam and Adam and the Adamic race. Now the Catholic Bible, as well as your Bible, refers to Jesus Christ. The Catholic Bible, the Douay version, especially Cardinal Stritch's versions approved. From 1950 back, refer to Jesus in the Book of Wisdom, and they say he is white, ruddy, reddish, complexioned, and chosen out of thousands. Then the book following it, no, it's the Book of Canticles that says that. The Book of Wisdom following that says of Jesus, he is of the race of Adam. Well, all you have to do is put the two together then. The race of Adam is white, ruddy, and reddish complexioned, isn't it? Oh, well, you see, this is important. Now, in the third chapter of Genesis, we're going to show you where right or early in the Bible, God mentions this race question. And what does he do? He declares a war between the races. In the third chapter of the book of Genesis. Oh, you say you never saw that in the Bible. No, you didn't see it in the Bible because you weren't thinking about a race. You were listening to all the garbage the Rabbi Billy Graham will tell you that Jesus is a black man and all that nonsense. And that all the races are the same. Well, I heard that preacher on the radio. I told you many times about him. One Sunday morning about 12 or 15 years ago or more. Right here in Los Angeles. And he said all the different races were the same. And I called him on the phone said I was a clergyman. I was interested in his message. And I had a question for him. And he said, yes, brother, what is it? And I said, you said all the different races were the same. He said, yeah, what's your question? I said, why did you say they were different? He couldn't answer it. He said, what do you mean? I said, you said the different races are the same. What do you think I am, a boob? To accept that nonsense? If they're the same, why did you say they were different? That's my question. And he hung up on the phone, of course. He couldn't answer it. Oh, I've heard these radio preachers say, well, you're not supposed to know these things about the Bible. They're mysteries. And they're nuts. You are supposed to know. That's what his job is to teach you. And he doesn't know, and he can't teach it, so he tells you you're not supposed to know, and that's his excuse for getting out of doing his job, because he doesn't know how to do it in the first place. He doesn't know his scriptures. He says, oh, we're all brothers. Well, in order to be my brother, you have to come from my father. If you didn't come from my father, you're not my brother. And then they take mistranslations.
nations and say, go out and preach to all the creatures. Creations? Creatures? Jesus said, go not but unto the lost sheep of the house of Israel. That's what he told his disciples. He told his disciples, go not but unto the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Don't go to anybody else. All right, that's important. But, oh, that's terrible. That's discrimination. You know, they tell you, you can't do that. Billy Graham and these, this, oh, this television preacher, I feel like, I'm lucky I have a boot tube left after I feel like throwing a beer bottle through it or something when I hear him. He stands there and he gets his arms out and he gets tears in his eyes and he says, let Jesus come into your heart. Let Jesus come into your heart. And I feel like throwing that something at the television. You know what he's doing? He's insulting your God and your race. You or me supposed to let Almighty God do anything. Who does he think he is? And who does he tell you you are? He doesn't tell you who Jesus is, does he? That's just like another Jew. That's just like everybody that hates Jesus Christ, Satan and all his kids, saying, Jesus, you're nothing. You're just a little punk. You just sit in the corner and wait till I decide to choose you. You just sit in the corner and wait till I let you come into my heart. I'll let Jesus do anything. You see, that's why they make the error. That's why that's Antichrist. It's not your faith. Then they tell you, love everything. How are you going to love your God, which is the first commandment he gave you? Love your God with all your heart and all your soul and all your mind. Now, tell me, how are you going to do that and love the devil at the same time? How are you going to love good and love evil? I've told you many times, this middle-of-the-road teaching that they're teaching in the churches is not Christianity. It's plain, unadulterated Satanism and Judaism. The only two things that stay in the middle of the road, I've told you, are the dead skunk and that yellow line. And most of those preachers have that yellow line right up the middle of their back. They're afraid to even use the word race. All right, we're going to use it. Because we don't fear the devil, we fear Jesus Christ, our God. And boy, you better watch out when you cross him. All right, in Genesis chapter 3, verses 3, 13 and 15, just two of them. What is it saying here? It says the Lord God. No, it said Yahweh God. We have records where the Jews posed as the as the Israelites. They've always posed as Israelites. They said they were the tribe of Judah, and they said they were the ones when Mark was pastor in Egypt who could translate the scriptures. And they put the, took the name Yahweh out wherever they could. They hated the name, it says, and they put the word Lord in. Well, some people think the word Lord means God, but it doesn't. The word Baal, the name of Satan translated into English is the word Lord. And Schofield's text show it. Your Bible, the dictionary show it, and that's the translation. So, it said Yahweh. They took the name Yahweh out. Yahweh God said to the woman, what is this that you have done? Now, this is the story where Eve was seduced. Now, you see, uh, your God put Adam and Eve in the earth. I told you about that earlier in the sermon here. They came after all the other races were created. It says so in chapter 2. It says in chapter 2, verse 4, these are the generations of the heavens and of the earth when they were created. And you want to underline that, those words, when they were created. In the day that Lord God made the earth and the heavens. Now that word generations was the Greek word genia, which was, means race. These were the races of people, it said in Greek, that God created. And every plant of the field was in the earth. <clears throat> and the God, the God had not caused it to rain, and there was not a man to till the ground. That's where the word Adam appeared in Hebrew. There was not an Adam to till the ground. Yet all these other races were created. Everything was created. But there wasn't an Adam to till the ground. So your Bible tells you, if you'll look at it closely, that Adam wasn't even here, and neither was Eve. Then it brings in Adam and Eve after that. And you'll notice that it says Adam was formed of the dust of the ground. For well, God formed didn't say that at all. That's the English translation. It said in the Hebrew that he formed Adam and Eve in flesh bodies in the earth, in the terrestrial plains. Terrestrial means the planet Earth. Well, the translators scratch their head on those words and say, well, the earth is dirt, so we'll write it that he formed them of the dust of the ground. You know we're not dust. We're not pieces of dirt. We're in flesh bodies on the earth. 
That's what it said, and the translators have mixed you up there. So now we go over to chapter 3. Here, Adam and Eve are on the earth. They're told not to mix with these other races that God had created, who had been here through all the catastrophes of the earth, and all you have to do is study a little anthropology and a little archaeology to learn that. <clears throat> well, then Eve was, says, she did eat of what? The fruit of the tree of knowledge? Yes, she allowed, she says here, <clears throat> in verse 13, he said to Eve, what is this that you have done? And the woman Eve said, the serpent beguiled me. And I did eat. Now we've got the serpent in there, haven't we? Oh, they tell you the serpent is just a snake that crawls on the ground, don't they? It's like St. Patrick's Day. Now I'll go over that one again for the benefit of new people hearing the tapes. On a March 17th every year, they get their people down here at the city hall and they get a big map out on the sidewalk and they get little reeds and start blowing snakes off the map of Ireland and they're saying St. Patrick drove the snakes out of Ireland. You know they tell you that, don't they? All you have to do is read up a little bit. Get the Encyclopedia Britannica, any old one, and read up on St. Patrick. You'll find he was born in London, England, of Italian parents. He was Italian. He went to Rome, and he became a Catholic priest. And he went back to the Isles of Britain, and he read all the Jews out of Ireland. He ran what this Bible says is the serpent race out of Ireland. That's why our subject today is the serpent seed because this identity is not only who you are, who are the devil's kids. And it's going to shock you, it's going to reverse your whole theology, but don't worry about it, I've already reversed mine, so I'm not worried about yours. I won't do something to you that I haven't already done to myself. <clears throat> the clergy and the ch churches tell you these Jews are God's chosen people, don't they? Oh, now you're going to say this guy doesn't like the Jews. You bet your boots I don't. I don't like any enemy of Jesus Christ. And I have a lot of, of indignation for a lot of these people who call themselves Christians, too, who are going out and selling Jesus Christ out for a quarter to the Jews because they don't know and because their preachers haven't told them who the Jew is. It's not essential just that you know who you are, that you're the Israelite of this book and the Jews aren't, but you better know your enemy because you're in a war. How would you like it if I went back to duty in the military and we were in combat and you had to assign, I got your children, your young boys in my outfit and I command an infantry regiment and you give me all your kids and let me put them in and take them into war. I say, okay, folks, before we go, I think I'll give these kids eight weeks basic training. Put them on a rifle range and teach them right foot from left foot. And I'll put them through some combat obstacle courses. And then I'll put a blindfold on them and take them over to the jungles and have them fight the heathen under my command. What would you think of me? You wouldn't get your kids back, would you? You'd leave them six feet under. Would I be a good commander to do that, to take your kids into combat with a blindfold over their eyes so they don't know who they are and don't know their enemy? And we have a lot of that today, even amongst our white people, our, our Caucasians, our own Israelite people. I've seen them throughout the years. They'll get a little bit of this message, even some preachers. And boy, they're going to teach it then. Then they're going to go out and be big wheels. They're going to be generals or captains, and they haven't even had the basic training of a private first class. But they all want to be generals. They all want to be the king. That's like I read in Isaiah to you, where David the king was old, and they wanted to get him some heat, it says. That's the language the Bible uses. The Bible's funny at times. So how did they do to get the old king heat? They gave him a nice, beautiful maiden, it says. Then they all wanted to be king. All of them wanted to be king under that deal. So here's, they haven't changed a bit, have they? Well, I would get back here. Eve did something here. Satan beguiled, serpent beguiled me. What's beguiled mean? Trick, deceit. What did he do? And she says, <clears throat> Yahweh God said to the serpent, 
Now, you think God's talking to a snake that crawls on the ground? We're going to find out who this serpent is. That's symbolic language. Because you have done this, you're cursed above all the cattle and above every beast of the field. On your belly you'll go and dust you'll eat all the days of your life. Now, this word dust, there's a note there, so you want to watch that. It refers back to Isaiah. And he says, I will put enmity between thee and the woman. Now, the woman is Eve, of course. And the serpent is who? A snake? Did a snake have intercourse with a woman? No, absolutely not. I'll put enmity between thy seed and her seed. And remember I told you the word seed was descendants? So there's going to be descendants of the serpent, and there's going to be descendants of the woman who are going to be at war. Who is the woman? You go into the Psalms, you go into Isaiah, and you go into your old Bible, all your Bible, and you'll find out who the woman is. You see, the Bible is written that way. It says, the woman are my people Israel. So here is a war between God's people Israel and the, or the seed of Israel and the seed of the serpent. The serpent seed, that's the subject of our sermon today. And he says, I'll put in me between thee and the woman and between thy seed and her seed. And it will bruise thy head and you shall bruise his heel. Something's going to happen in this war. Well, now you know very well it's not a snake that we're at war with. The Bible's going to tell you who the serpent is and who the descendants of the serpent are. Well, let's find out. Let's go to Matthew. Jesus Christ told you in Matthew chapter 13, verses 24 to 29. We read this in the parable of the wheat and the tares. Another parable he put forth to them. Now he said, the kingdom of heaven is like a man which sowed good seed in his field. Remember this seed? When you have children, you're sowing seed. Same as you plant seed for, for vegetables. Your seed is in your child, isn't it? Or your offspring. But he says, while men slept. No, it said while Adamites slept. The descendants of Adam. His enemy came. Oh, Adam has an enemy? Well, Eve had one, didn't she? Right in the third chapter of Genesis. Satan seduced her. And sowed tares amongst the wheat, and then he went his way. But when the blade was sprung up, brought forth fruit, the tares appeared. So the servants of the householder came and said, Do we not? Don't you sow good seed in your field? How come it has tares in it? Have you ever seen tares in a wheat field? You know what their color is? The same color as back of all the Jew-sponsored communism all over the world, red. Tears are red. Well, he said to them, an enemy has done this. The servants then said, well, you should we go and gather them up? No, he said, lest while you gather up the tears, you root up also the wheat with them. Don't do it yet, there's a time coming, he says. All right, so they didn't understand this, and his disciples then asked him to answer it. And in verse 36 through 39, Jesus answers it. He says, then Jesus sent the multitude away, and he went into the house. His disciples came to him. They said, declare unto this the parable of the tares of the field. In other words, explain this parable to us. And Jesus said to them, he that sows the good seed is the son of man, it says in English. No, the word son in English was translated from the word seed, and the word man from the word Adam, and it said in the Hebrew, he that sows the good seed is the seed of Adam. The seed of Adam is the good seed. The field is this world, or this earth, this world order. The good seed are the children of the kingdom. All right, Adam's descendants are the children of the kingdom. But the tares are the children of the wicked one, and the one enemy that sowed them is the devil. Oh, Jesus told you the devil has children. The tares are the children of the wicked one, and the one that sowed them is Satan, the devil. Jesus tells you right there. The enemy that sowed them is the devil. The harvest is the end of this world order and the reapers are the angels. Right there, Jesus identified the children of the devil. No, he didn't identify them yet, did he? But he told you that Satan planted his seed in the earth. He planted his descendants in the earth when he beguiled Eve. Oh, he planted them before that, but he planted them in God's race. That's why you have some Jews that look like white men you know there are black Jews, too? They're called Palasha. You've got one on the Supreme Court of the United States, Thurgood Marshall. The blacks know about the Palashas. Why don't the whites? Or the Caucasians? You know that there are Asiatic Jews by the millions? In Asia, in the Mongol area? Called Khazars? All right, they 
were Jews before, and they're Jews now, Asiatic Jews. Ben Franklin wrote a tract, tract saying, do not allow the Jews in America because they're Asiatics. They're not going to... race that built this land. Well, yes. You see, that's why I said race is key to this book. You don't understand the racial background of this book. You don't understand the book. All right, so now we go to 1 John, and we'll find out in chapter 3, verse 11 to 12. For this is the message that you heard from the beginning, it says, that we should love one another, but not as Cain, who was of that wicked one, and slew his brother Abel. Oh, Cain was of that wicked one, the Bible says. What did we just read in the words of Jesus when he said the one who planted the tares is that wicked one called the devil? So Cain is of that wicked one. So Cain's got to be of the one Jesus said was the devil, is not he? All right. Cain's of the wicked one. Now, Adam couldn't be the wicked one because in that parable, Jesus said the children of Adam are the children of the kingdom, the good seed. Well, now we go back then to Genesis. And we're going back now to chapter 4 in Genesis. The first 15 verses. So you see, we're going from the first part of the Bible back into it and back and forth in it. That's the way it's written. You've got to do that to understand it. So in chapter 4, it says, Adam knew his wife Eve, and she conceived and bare Cain. Now, that's a mistranslation completely. It doesn't fit with truth. The truth doesn't contradict itself, and that contradicts the truth. That Adam is the good seed. Because it says she conceived and bore Cain, and she said, I have gotten a man from the Lord. Well, did she say, I have gotten a man from the Lord, meaning that Lord God? No. You go to the Hebrew... And remember I told you the name Baal, which was one of the names Satan used, is translated into the English word Lord. And she said, here I have had one from Baal. That's what she said in that chapter, of, fourth chapter of Genesis. To Adam, referring to Cain, I have had a man from Baal. In other words, I have had an offspring from Satan. Satan seduced me, and I produced an offspring from Satan. And again, she bare his brother Abel. And Abel was a keeper of sheep, but Cain was a tiller of the ground. Now you'll know if you just study chronology, you'll find that Abel was born three years after Cain. That's why in the genealogy of Jesus in Luke, you don't find Cain or Abel listed. It drops them completely. From Seth, who is the son of Adam, who is the son of God, it drops Cain and Abel. Why? Because if you'll study divine law, you'll find that it takes seven years for the gestation or cleansing of the womb from a violation of God's law and a pollution of that womb. Cain's birth was a pollution of the womb, violation of God's law. And it wasn't seven years. When Abel was born, it was only three. So God provided that as an example for you to prove to you that Satan's descendants would try to kill Adam and Eve's true offspring. And he allowed it to happen because Jesus even said when he came, I do everything as an example for you so you'll understand it. And it says, in process of time, it came to pass that Cain brought of the fruit of the ground an offering to God. Abel, he also brought of the firstlings of the flock. All right, he always said to Cain, but unto Cain his offering he had not respect. Why, Cain was a Satan's seed. Yahweh wasn't going to have anything to do with that here. And Cain was angry. Yahweh said to Cain, why are you angry? It says the Lord. It didn't say the Lord. It was Yahweh. They took it out. The translators didn't put the word Lord in there. I'll show you how they really confuse you in this first chapter 4 of Genesis by doing that. But he says, why are you angry? If you do well, will you not be accepted? And if you do not well, sin lies at the door. And unto you shall be his desire, and you'll rule over him. Then Cain talked with Abel, his brother. Well, it came to pass when they were in the field that Cain rose up against Abel, his brother, and slew him. So now we find out, we know that Cain murdered Abel, don't we? And it says, the Lord said to Cain, where is Abel, your brother? No, it didn't. You check the Hebrew, it said, Yahweh said to Cain, where's your brother? But the translators took the name Yahweh out, like I said these Jews would do, and put the word Lord in there. Yahweh, or Jesus, which is the English of Yahweh, he 
said to Cain, where is Abel, your brother? And Cain says, am I, I know not, am I my brother's keeper? All right, you get out of these Jew synagogues, you'll see that written right on them. Am I my brother's keeper? The Jews say that. See? Cain must have been a Jew then, huh? You think that doesn't fit? Well, let's find out. He can be married Abel. And he said, what have you done? And the voice of your brother's blood will cry cries to me from the ground, God said. And now you're cursed from the earth, which has opened her mouth to receive your brother's blood from your hand. See, there was a curse involved there. Well, if you'd look up the name Yehudi in Hebrew and look at the English translation of that Hebrew word Yehudi, the English translation is the word J-E-W, Jew. And Yehudi in Hebrew means the cursed ones. And was Cain cursed? Was the serpent cursed? You bet. Right in the third and fourth chapter of Genesis. God cursed him. Now, he said, now you're cursed. When you till the ground, it won't yield any strength. A fugitive them in a vagabond you'll be throughout the earth. Well, Cain said, it says, Cain said unto the Lord, my punishment's greater than I can bear. No, it said, Cain said to Yahweh, my punishment's greater than I can bear. And behold, you have driven me this day from the face of the earth. And from your thy face shall I be hid. Well, you see, the translator said, from the face of the earth. So they say, well, Cain went off the face of the earth, don't they? That's what the preachers tell you. But they don't explain how right later he went over to the land of Nod and knew his wife and built a city for all those people. They don't explain to you that of Cain and Abel, which they tell you, are the first two sons of Adam and Eve, and Adam and Eve were the first people on the earth. They had Cain and then Abel. That's only four. Well, who did Cain go over? then? How did you build a city for all those people? Where did they come from? They don't tell you that, do they? Well, the Bible tells you, if you look at it, and it says, everyone that finds me, Cain said, will try to kill me. Then it says, the Lord said to him, therefore, whoever slays Cain, vengeance will be taken on him sevenfold. No, it didn't say that at all. If they put the word Lord for Baal. In that verse. And Baal, it said, said to Cain, whoever tries to kill you, I'll take vengeance on him. Certainly Baal was talking to his own offspring. Satan was talking to Cain, his kid. Wouldn't you say to your kid, I'll protect you if these guys, if the whitey out here tries to kill you? Sure you would. That's what Satan was doing. He knew what he was doing, and these translators, these Jew translators knew what they were doing when they put these words, Lord, in here for the word Baal and then the word Lord for Yahweh. All right, now let's go to Matthew. We found out that Cain murdered Abel, huh? Let's go to Matthew chapter 23, verses 29 to 35. Here's Jesus speaking. He says, woe unto you, scribes, and you Pharisees, you hypocrites. Now, these were the false Pharisees he was talking about because the true Pharisees were true Israelites. The true Pharisees were resurrectionists, the Bible says. The Sadducees were reincarnationists, and those Sadducees were Jews who had invaded Jerusalem and taken over in those days. And then there was a Jew named Shammah, and that Jew said, let's us pose in the Sanhedrin as Pharisees. Let's not be Sadducees. That's just like this Jew from New York who calls himself a Republican conservative. Uh, there's been several of them up there. 
Uh, I've forgotten their names. They don't mean enough. Javits is one. Uh, and uh, Layman's and all of those. Pose as Republicans and conservatives. That's an ancient trick of these satanic people. Well, <clears throat> he says, you hypocrites, you build the tombs of the prophets. You garnish the sepulchres of the righteous. And you say that if we had been in the days of our fathers, we wouldn't have been partakers with them in the blood of the prophets. Jesus was telling the Jews they were the prophet killers. <clears throat> and they said, if we'd have lived in that day, we wouldn't have done it. Wherefore, he says, you're witnesses to yourselves that you're the children of those who did kill the prophets. You see, if I accused you of being a killer of my grandfather, or your ancestors, if I'd have said your grandfather killed my grandfather, and you says, well, if I'd have been around then, I wouldn't have done it, then you admit that you're the child, grandchild of that one that killed my grandfather, don't you? It's just what the Jews did with Jesus, see? <clears throat> so, he says, wherefore, you're witnesses to yourself that you are the children of those which killed the prophets. Now, you fill up the measure of your fathers. You serpents. You generation of vipers. <clears throat> Remember, what's the serpent? Jesus didn't even call them Jews. He called them devils. Serpents, snakes, the serpent race. You generation of vipers. Now, you read this passage in the Greek. He said, you race of devils. How can you escape the damnation of hell? And he's talking to the Jews. Wherefore, behold, I send you prophets and wise men and scribes. Some of them you'll kill and crucify. Some of them you'll scourge in your synagogues and persecute them from city to city. That upon you may come all the righteous blood shed upon the earth, from the blood of righteous Abel to the blood of Zacharias, the son of Barachias, who you slew between the temple and the altar. Oh, what did he say here? Read it carefully. He said that the Jews were responsible for the death of Abel. He identified the Jews as the descendants of the one who murdered Abel. And who was that? Cain. So Jesus identified these Jews that look like white people or Caucasians as the descendants of Cain. Right there. Many other places too. All right. Now, they're the descendants of Cain. Let's go to John 8, chapter 12 to 59. <clears throat> then spoke Jesus to them. And he's speaking here. I am the light of the world. He that follows me will not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. Then the Pharisees, now these were the false Pharisees. They were called Shema Pharisee. Or shame, the English word shame comes from the name of that Jew, Shema, who said we'll pose as Pharisees when in reality we're really Jew Sadducees. But that had to be because there were very few true Israelites in the Sanhedrin in the days of Jesus. All the Israelites had gone. They'd gone up through the Caucasus, between the Black and Caspian Sea and their land migrations. They'd gone into captivity. Where? Up into Western Europe, where they became Sakai, Scythians, Saxons, Germans, Swedes, Scandinavians. Those were the Israelites, called Caucasians now, because they went through the past called the Caucasus. And there were only 27 true Israelites.